We got to come out there. Yeah, come on. The dogs are chasing lizards, if you're wondering what the commotion is in the back. <laughs> they think that they're absolutely delightful to chase. <laughs> It's fun to watch Buddy come in with a little tail flopping. <laughs> <laughs> His mouth open. He never eats them. He just, just, plays the plays. just plays exactly right. So, where do you want to start tonight? It's a great message. Dunamis. What good. was the message about again? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I never, never heard him phrase like that before. You know, I know somewhere deep down that message is planted in my heart, but in my mind I can't it, find it. It's gone right there as well, and that helps. What did you say? And that helps. <laughs> yeah, I never knew that phrase. Oh well. Power, you know. Oh. Power. That was Doing a mess. Mercy and love, yeah. and that's a way I connect with grace. But it's much more powerful to be power. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, grace is not the mercy or the love of God. We confuse that. Grace yeah. is not God uh, overlooking God our sins. Right? Mm -hmm. it's not, yeah, it's not God being nice to us, even though we were bad boys and girls. Mercy. That's not what grace is. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, if you go look at Jesus, when, when Paul cries out thrice, Jesus says, my grace is your sufficiency. He goes on to describe that as the strength that is in him. Right? So he's talking about the strength that is in me is the vitality that is the force behind your life now. See, that, right? makes, the, that makes all the sense. Yeah, and so grace is more about the, vi the, the, the force, uh, the vitality of God that's the power behind our lives. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. ah, ah, that's good. That's great. It's the strength of God. Right? It's his sufficiency. Right? Yeah. Which is weird. I think I said it, but it's kind of weird to think of it like that with God because he's God. And so you think of every... There's no beginning or end in him. Right. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So it's difficult to look at a thing and say something comes from something else. Because it's almost like, no, they're all going on simultaneously at the right. same time. Right. There's nothing that's with the beginning in him, mm -hmm. right? That they're all, everything was just always there. Right. And so it can be difficult to think of it that way if you can understand um, what, I, what I'm saying yeah. with, with that dynamic. Wow. Yeah, it talks about the power of God. You will receive dunamis, dunamis right. from on high, yeah. right? Okay. To be witnesses of what? Yeah. Of the resurrection. To be witnesses of what God did to divorce man from sin and death, right? What God did to braid man together with his life. They were going to be witnesses of that. And what does it mean to be witnesses of the resurrection? I don't even think we think about these kinds of things. But to be a witness of the resurrection is to testify that in Christ is a life that is stronger than the sin and death that's in the world. In Christ is a life that actually rules and reigns over even sin and death, right? Within Christ is a life that is stronger than the, the strength of, the, of death, right? That's what it means to be a witness. And so these apostles were going around, and they had to receive power from on high to be witnesses of this life, right? Yes. And so when they walked around, like all the stuff that went down, it was to testify of a life that had overcome the world. Remember, Jesus said, listen, in the, in the world you'll have tribulation, but don't be afraid, for I've, I've overcome the world. Right. And so these guys were testifying to a bunch of people who had been in sin and death. Mm -hmm. That there was a life that actually possessed the ability to overcome the corruption in the world that's tried to come against you. There is such a thing that can conquer it. There is such a thing that can remove it. There is such a thing. And so these guys were witnesses of that. Now, how did they witness of that? They went around manifesting that life in various different forms. We'll just use one example of Paul. He picked up that serpent on the island. When he picked up that serpent on the island, it was a poisonous, poisonous snake, and it bit his arm. What happened? Did he die? No. Okay. What did that witness to those people on the island? That in this God is a life that even overcomes the death of the most venomous viper we've ever seen. What? Right? And so they're walking around. That's one thing Jesus was walking around doing. I am the resurrection and the life. Your sin is forgiven you, man. The corruption that's come upon your life has been sent away from you, is what he was saying to those people. And so he's testifying that there is a life that possesses the ability to send away sin and death and to consume it. And to remove it. And to keep it away. 
Right. It's interesting yes. that they would actually say in their own way, God's in that guy. Yeah. Yeah. God, <laughs> the gods. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Whatever God this guy is worshiping, that That's God right. has a life God. in him that conquers death. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And you know, it's interesting too how, uh, you know, people, when, when you think about grace, grace theology or whatever, uh, people would actually say that the gospel of God's grace is, uh, is dangerous. Would you believe that some people actually think mm -hmm. and believe that? Yeah. But they do. But they don't realize that the gospel of God's grace is the gospel. Yeah. There is no other gospel. And, and godliness can, can only be right. derived through his grace and his power working within us. You know? so. Well, just like the verse, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God, God. God. Right. salvation. Yeah. Right. And we, we, we were, if you go back to Romans 5, it talks about how we were without strength. Yeah. For when we were yet without strength, it means the power behind our lives, that our vital force was the world and the death and the corruption that was in the world. And so we were without strength. We were conceived in weakness. It means that we were brought forth in weakness. Our lives were brought forth in weakness. And so God's like, there's no weakness in me. And the life that's in me is so sufficient that it even possesses the ability to fill all insufficiency. And so then he comes and gives us that life, right? That life and that more abundantly. More abundantly. Well, there's no end to it. There's no like coming behind it. So it's like you shall receive power on high from when, from the Holy Spirit, right? Is what he says. And what is it that raised Jesus from the dead? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. What did the Holy Spirit do inside of Jesus when it raised him from the dead? It warded it over sin and death. Jesus was a man that had the fullness of sin and death upon him and in his body. And when the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead, that Holy Spirit warded it over sin and death. That was the power of God to, to cleanse him from the wound of death, right? Inside of his human flesh. The power of God is put on display. So Jesus tells the, the disciples, listen, man, you're going to receive power upon high to be witnesses of the resurrection. And you're going to receive that from the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of what? Grace. Yes. Isn't it called the spirit of life? Yes. The spirit of truth. Okay, so it says you're going to receive dunamis from that spirit, right? And it's going to strengthen you on the inside with the very vitality of God. And then you're going to walk around in that vitality of God that is in you and hold, upholding you and around you. It's going to manifest. And it's going to testify of a life that has overcome sin and death, right? And not just overcome sin and death ethereally, it's overcome sin and death in a material body, right? It isn't just like a philosophy or like a, a lofty thought. Right? It actually took something that was matter and that had sin and death on it, and it overcame sin and death within matter, right? And they were testifying of that, right? And that's what the gospel is. Is technically testifying of, yeah. right? right? That's what it's testifying of. In God is a, is a is a sufficiency, a sufficiency to overcome sin and death, to lord it over sin and death, to make sin and death cry, to yeah. put yeah. sin and death in time out, to ground <laughs> sin and death, yeah. right? To remove it outside of the situation, right? There's a life. There's a sufficiency in God. That is able to do that. And that's what the gospel is the testimony of, right? right? So that believers, and even people who don't believe, can be persuaded to believe. But for believers, listen, man, what starts to happen is we begin to consider that life when we walk in the earth. And when we see corruption and sin and death, the way we weigh it, we begin to weigh it in light of a light that lords it over sin and death. Right? Mm -hmm. And we begin seeing the world that way. Right? It's like what Abraham said. He, what Paul said about Abraham. says Abraham didn't consider the deadness in his flesh. Right. Why not? He didn't just not consider it. 
his non-consideration of it was born from him first considering the all-sufficiency of God. There was no vacuum. <laughs> no, so he saw that there's deadness in his flesh, but when he thought about whether he could be the father of many nations, he knew that in God was a sufficiency that could even overcome the deadness of its flesh and bring forth life. Right? right. So when he thought of, can I be the father of many nations, he didn't look and say, oh, well, look at this death in my body. No, I can't. That's not what he said. He knew that in God was a sufficiency that could even overcome the death in his flesh to bring forth life. That's this guy, God, right? El Shaddai. This guy possesses the ability to even bring forth life out of the midst of my dead flesh. What? Right? And so he, he gave glory to God. What that means is he considered the life in God when he considered the deadness of his flesh. He considered it in light of that. And believers, man, I just got to be honest, most of us are walking around in the earth as if the sin and death in the world is the greatest thing that's ever happened. As if it's the most powerful thing that's ever happened. And we're going to be afraid of it. And we're going to be scared of it. And we're going to bow down at its feet. We're going to cry about it when it comes. And we're going to, uh, uh, uh. I mean, it's like, man, didn't we read Acts 1? Yeah. <laughs> Where it says, you shall receive power from on high. Do we think that it was only talking to the disciples? Is, does it, did, did, did Joel say that the Holy Spirit report out on all flesh? Or are these 12 guys flesh? Yeah. Right. And so have we somehow received a different dunamis than they received? Mm -hmm. Do we have a different spirit than they have? No. It's just we're not thinking about the spirit the way they were thinking about the spirit. Right? We haven't been thinking about the gospel in terms of eternal life and how eternal life conquers sin and death. It smacks it around. We've been thinking about the gospel in light of, well, God was real mad at us because we behaved poorly, and now because he beat on Jesus a little bit, he's not mad at us anymore. And then we walk around in that. There's no two of us in that. No. Right? No. It's like we made the whole gospel a relational thing. And please don't misunderstand me. Don't hear what, don't hear what I'm not saying. The gospel is very relational. And I think you guys would know me more so than most people. Man, God's like my best friend. He's tangible. He's with me. I talk to him about everything. But because the Western idea of the gospel was turned into God was angry at us because we behaved badly, and now he's no longer angry about us, we've ripped out the power, which is that there's a life that conquered sin and death. And that God conquered sin and death. And that's the message of the gospel. Your sin has been sent away from you, man. It's been conquered by the life of God. What did Paul say? That God has abolished death and brought to light life and immortality. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we have a relationship with God. But the power of the gospel is not found in thinking, well, God did want to be around me, and now he does. No. <clears throat> that's not where the power of the gospel is found. The power of the gospel is found in seeing that you have been made a partaker in the life of God with him. You are sharing in God's life with him. And now, what is it that this life can do? Oh, we see that this life lords it over sin and death. Yes. And not in an ethereal way or in a I'll go to heaven one day way, but in a way that's pertaining to matter because it conquered sin and death in the flesh of Jesus. Right? Right. And so we, we've completely lost sight of that side of the gospel. Right? And we made it just about, oh, no, 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 man. Restored relationship. It's restored relationship, brothers and sisters. And please understand what I'm saying. Listen, man, God the person was never away from us. He was always there. Now, did we not engage with him like we could have? No, we did not. And so from that standpoint, yes, we see God is with us, Emmanuel. And we see that he's the friend of sinners. And so we begin engage, engaging with him from a relational perspective. But if we completely lose sight of the fact that the, the cross and the resurrection is about Christus Victor, about how God overcomes sin and death, and we don't talk about that and how that animates our life, how we've been animated with the life that conquers sin and death, and we don't sit around talking about that and chewing on that and talking about what it means, but we don't begin to lay our lives in this world based on the sufficient, the all-sufficient one now living inside of us. Listen, we're missing it. Right? Yeah, hey, right. In Romans, Paul writes this and says, But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies 
through the spirit that dwells in you. Right. Now, when he talks about quickening his mortal bodies, he's going to raise us from the dead. Yeah. But he is quickening our mortal bodies today. Now. Right now. That's it. That's it. And so we, we want the, the conduct of our conversation to, to be about the life of God. Right? And I don't think we think about it, but the strength of God is found in his life. And so the whole point was, how are we going to see grace abounding in our lives? Right? Which is the dunamis. How are we going to walk in this world having our lives filled with the dunamis? And I don't mean in theory. Right? Because then I'll talk to a guy and say, oh, well, everybody's standing in his grace. Well, great. Is everybody experiencing his grace? What good is it for everybody to be standing in his grace if everybody's not tasting the grace? Right? So can we move on from everybody standing in his grace? Can we talk about how people can taste his grace? Right? What good does it do a guy to have eternal life available to him if he don't ever eat from it? Yeah. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so Paul's talking about, man, how are we going to see grace abound in our lives? We see there's a grace that when there was sin and death reigning over everybody, there was a grace that manifested that super abound over sin and death. It's interesting, that word that they use, super abound. So it wasn't like, well, it was neck and neck. And, you know, the, the grace got a little surge there at the end, and it just spread ahead. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with that. It's super abounded is the Greek word Paul talks about. So he's talking about there exists a strength or a power that makes sin and death look like nothingness. Nothingness. That when they stand next to each other, there's a grace that shrinks the sin and the death. Right? right? Yep. And that's the power that Paul's talking about <coughs> in Romans. That's the, the grace. That's the strength of God. And in Romans 6, he talked about how are we going to find that abound in our lives, right? I, I was, it's, I this is the message I was thinking. I don't know how many messages I've heard on the Holy Spirit, but it's more than one than two hands worth <laughs> over, the, over the many years. This message made so much sense in that it didn't focus on the Holy Spirit, but it focused on, like you said, the vitality of God in our lives. And that vitality has overcome everything. And when you start seeing it's more and more of the perspective that eternal life has overcome everything in this world, sin and death, and you're living in that eternal life, that makes that makes the in my in my view, it makes the power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, just that much more real and exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah, and it, it's like what, what what John said about remitting sin, right? Those that you send sin of death away from, it will be sent away from them. Those you imputed to them, it will be as if it was imputed to them. Right? right? He talks about what is bound in heaven is bound on earth. And what we don't realize is that God's life was dwelling in a man named Jesus, mm -hmm. the Son of God. And within that man, Jesus, in a flesh and bone body, sin and death has been bound by eternal life. And now we come declaring that, right? And we come telling people that about the sin and the death that's in the world and how it's been bound, right? And we come with that message, right? We come with the message of the life of God so that people can walk in that life. Yeah. Because when you walk in that life, Guess what it does to you? It animates you with grace. It saturates you with the very vitality of God. Mm -hmm. It animates you with dunamis. You begin walking around like a man possessed by God instead of a man or a woman possessed by some demon spirit. Right? Yeah. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans. He, he talks about how sin caused death to reign over us. Right? Yep. And he talked about where sin got its power from to bring forth its fruit in us was through death. Sin can't bring forth its fruit in us outside of death. Outside of death reigning over us or outside of death persuading somebody that death is reigning over them. Outside of sin persuading somebody death is reigning over them. And so in the same way, the way that you would find your life coming under the power of grace 
is by walking in the word of eternal life, right? When you walk in the word of God's life, that God's life is your life, it brings forth grace yes. inside of you, right? It does, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's what the point of the message is. You remember now? <laughs> You remember that? <laughs> yeah. No, okay. yeah. Yeah, I think I must have missed something. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, now I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little distracted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, yeah, I mean, it's like. How quickly we we're getting yeah. old. We're getting old. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but once uh, you start talking about it, you know, it comes right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, the, book, the hooks are there. It's really there. there. It's really there. Yeah. So, I know. He's there. <laughs> He's there. <so. laughs> uh, uh, it was a great word. Really good. It was good. Why? Why did you? Why do you think it was great? You had to get put me on the spot. I am. Yeah. I don't remember, but the whole time I was sitting there, I was just like, this is so awesome. So, <laughs> you know, if you know, it was so, so good, but just like, I can't repeat it. But it was excellent. And I was so happy when Fred was there, Linda was there to hear it, because it was just a big blessing. And she said, oh, how much she enjoyed it, you know? That's great. So that was cool. Awesome. She needs to come more often. Yeah. But she lives a long way away. Yeah. So has anybody else heard, you know, a message on the Holy, essentially on the Holy Spirit preached in, in that? I mean, I've heard about dunamis, and, you know, as the root word for dynamite and all right. that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's kind of interesting, the, the passage that I just read, that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead resides in you. Your body is dead, but the spirit of life, or he, that he's going to quicken your mortal bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, I just happened because I got all these different versions. The New International Version, right before that, said, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. I want to tell you something. I completely disagree with that, 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 uh, that verbiage. Because living in a realm of something is some kind of a mind thing. You know, that you're, uh, I live by this way of thinking. But that's not really what the scriptures are talking about. He's talking about God giving life to our mortal bodies, whereby his life is that which begins to emanate from us. That is actually what, what, what Paul is trying to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. And to, you know, how they can say, we who live in the realm of the spirit or the realm of the flesh. It, it's just not, well, they also, I don't think that's an accurate no. they also probably the idea it. that we have a sin nature. Yeah. Not to mention the fact, I gotta, I gotta say this, I have the new internet, an old new international but yeah. it does not say that. Yeah. They continually screwing it up more and more. Yeah. Oh. The, uh, gosh, what's the word now? Now I can't think of the word. Sinaticus. Codex Sinaiticus. All those Bibles have started adopting Codex Sinaiticus. Which is? Right. It's a translation that was found. They call all the old translations Codex. One they found at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Codex Sinaiticus. Which, for, for my money, it's a forgery. Is that, is that where Moses threw the Ten Commandments and broke them up? It said if there was a monk, I think a monk, a monastery, up there, and they found this this transcript there. They call it Codex Sinaiticus. Many of these modern translations, the NIV, a bunch of these other things, they've adopted that now as the primary source behind what they're writing. Sure. And it's not it's not good. Yeah. It's not right. It, it isn't good. But does everybody see that the power of grace abounding in our lives is found in walking in God's life? Yes. What does it mean to walk in God's life? You understand where this your source of life comes from. Yeah, it comes, from. and that you don't try to achieve anything in your own strength. Is there any lack in God's life? No. no Can you add to God's life? No. Can you take from God's life? No. Can you steal from God's life? Can you kill God's life? No. Can you overcome God's life? 
Can you corrupt God's life? Can God's life be decayed? Can it be kept from any good thing? Okay. So it's called the word of life. John says that which was from the beginning. We, the word of life. We've held it. We've touched it. The word of God's life, the makeup of it, the DNA of it, the genetics of his life, it consists of something. It's woven of a certain fabric or material that con contains all the things we just talked about. Right? Now, as we walk in the word of that life, and we walk in it from the perspective of that life is our life. It animates us with a supernatural strength as we walk in this earth. The sufficiency behind our life is no longer the life in the world. Have you ever noticed when things, let's say things are going good for you this week. Let's say everything went, not like for Bertie. <laughs> let's say everything went amazingly well for you this week. Have you noticed what that feels like? It feels good, doesn't it? You feel like there's a strength right behind you, right? right? I mean, you feel like, well, bam. You want to do a little jig, maybe get a little booty bump, a little booty bump with whoever you're with, you know, you go, eh, eh, like that, right? And so there's a strength that comes from walking in the word of a life that is not able to be decayed. And not only can it not be decayed, but when decay comes upon it, it swallows the decay. When corruption tries to come upon it, it swallows the corruption, right? And so when you walk in that life, the word of that life, and you start finding yourself believing that you've been braided together with that life, that it's more impossible to separate you from that life than it is to separate God from himself. When you begin walking in that, there's a supernatural strength that comes behind you. There's a vitality that you're infused with. There is like a strength that you're conceived in, a sufficiency that you're conceived in. And it causes you to just be like full of doing them, mm -hmm. right? And you walk in the earth that way, having all sufficiency in all things, right? I don't think we realize what it's like to walk in the earth actually believing that we have all sufficiency in all things. I mean, I'm just being honest. We walk in life weighing everything out to determine where it is we lack. And how it is we lack. And then how horrible we feel about the lack. Instead of walking in the word of God's life. That doesn't, I'm not saying that there's any shame. We feel weakness. But we feel weakness and we feel smacked around. We start fellowshipping with the fact that we've been braided together with God's life. And we start thinking about how God's life swallows decay. God's life swallows corruption. God's life fills all things, right? He is all and in all. And he's in me. And in any empty spaces or any void or any darkness or blackness I encounter, the light that's in me is so much that it will even fill all that out with light, right? Man, when you believe that, it does something to you when you walk in the earth, right? And that's what Jesus was telling the disciples was going to come upon them. This is what Paul was talking about in Romans, about how is grace going to abound in our lives? How are we going to find ourselves becoming slaves to righteousness? How are we going to find ourselves walking in this earth, being clothed upon with the fruit of God's life, and finding the manifestation of God's life flowing out of us like a river of living water, where when people come around you, they don't just get wet because you spit on them when you talk, but when they come around you, they get wet because of the river of living water that's pouring out of you. Right? Where when you get stoned to death up on a hill, you get back up from the dead and you go down into the next town and you preach the same thing. Now, do you think Paul was considering what he looked like? And then he just died on the ground. Do you think Paul went to the hospital before he went into Galatia? Do you think Paul's like, well, I mean, I need some ointment. You know, I need to find a Paul. I mean, I just got stoned to death after all, don't you know? You think he was considering that? You know what he was considering? That he's infused with the life of God. And he got back up and he went down. And left, right? And so what I've been, people ask me all the time, Greg, why do you preach so much about life and death? Death is what causes us to feel weakness. Yeah. 
It's what tries to steal the strength in our lives. It, it's what makes us feel defeated, fragile, weak, empty, uh, right? But life is the thing that causes us to feel full, right? And so the more we talk about the life of God and what the life of God looks like and how it warded over sin and death, and that we've been braided together with that life, and we talk about what this life does to sin and death and how it, it the, the makeup of it, and we begin being persuaded that that's all right. Man, when we walk through this earth, it's going to change everything. You ain't going to care if people like you or not. You're not going to be trying to be justified in people's eyes. You're not going to be worried thinking about what do they think about you? What do they think about your life? You're not going to be worried about whether your wife likes you or not, or whether your husband likes you or not. I mean, you hope they like you, but you're not going to be all like distraught about it, right? You're not going to be busy fighting with one another. You're not going to be trying to be justified from your spouse or from a spouse or from the world. You're going to lose sight of that because you're going to be busy with the life that can't last. And it's all the time in every situation going to tell you there is no lack. It's all the time in every situation going to tell you you have sufficiency, all sufficiency in all things, right? This guy, Chaz, came with his wife, Brittany, to see us from uh, Michigan a little while ago. And uh, he said something interesting to me, and I'm going to butcher everything that he said after it. But he said he's like a bass that you can just keep pulling out. You just keep pulling out, Right? It's like when Jesus passed around the fish in the loaves. Did it look like there was lack there? Did, did Jesus think there was lack? No, he did not. The disciples <laughs> thought there was lack, yeah, yeah. right? And they were even distraught about it. Yes. But Jesus was busy with the life that can't lack. And that in the presence of lack, he was busy with the life that fills all things and is all and in all. And he acted according to the fact that he was busy with that life. That life was the power behind what he did there. When he saw what was going on there, the right reason he did what he did is because he knew the life that he had with the Father. He knew what that life looked like. He knew what that life was. He knew what that life could do. Right? And so he just did it. And what kept coming out of the basket? Fish and loaves. Fish and loaves. Fish and loaves. Do you guys see that? And so, man, that's why I'm preaching about life and death so now. Everything that torments us is death. The reason why Paul said, for when we were yet without strength, or when we were brought forth in weakness, he's talking about when death was reigning over us. Go read the context of Romans 5. When death was reigning over us and making us weak and filling us with all weakness and bringing forth our lives in total and utter weakness, where we didn't see that, that we didn't have sufficiency in anything, that we lacked everything. In that place, man, God sent his son, Jesus, and the grace that was in Jesus superabounded over that sin and that death to manifest the life of God in the earth, right? In human flesh. So that now we no longer walk in the oldness of death, but now we walk in the newness of life. And as we walk in the newness of life, we find the, the power behind our lives is the very strength of God instead of the strength that's of the world, which really isn't strength at all. It's weakness, right? The power behind our lives isn't the world any longer. But we walk every day in the world weighing out our life in the world. We're trying to suck life out of the world. We're looking for strength from the world instead of looking for strength in the life of God. Then, oh, by the way, he come and gave it to us for free. Right? Yes. It doesn't require anything for you to attain to it. All it requires for, of you is for you to want to partake of it free. For you to want to think about it, talk about it, ask God about it, wrestle with him about it. What does it look like? I don't know what it means. What, do you, what is he talking about, the fabric? What does that mean? I think I used that example in the message, the fabric. In, 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 in yesteryear, I don't think I've ever used that word before. <laughs> like wool and silk could be corrupted by moths because of the fabric it was woven with. A moth could get up there and put holes in it. The larvae, it happened in my suit. But then they started making like cottons and synthetic fabrics that couldn't be corrupted by moths. 
There's a fabric that was, it was woven from a certain fabric that couldn't be eaten by moths. It couldn't be corrupted. Man, God's life is woven in such a way that it can't be corrupted by sin. Right? And now that's the fabric that our lives have been woven from. Right? And that's where we want to be weighing our lives. When we think of our lives, we want to be thinking about that. When we think of sin and death or we encounter it, we want to be thinking about the resurrection. We want to be thinking about if Jesus is a life that made sin and death bow down, that made sin and death cry, that life is in me. Oh, I received doings from on high, right? Yes. And you begin thinking that way as you walk through the earth, right? And you begin telling people, about that life and what it does to sin and death, right? You begin to be a witness, right? And you don't have to be a witness like they were. You could be a witness in all sorts of different ways. You can be a witness like they did. God can do supernatural miracles, but you can also be a witness in the sense that fear will be purged from your heart. And when you're a person walking in the world with no more fear in your heart, listen, that's a powerful thing. And people will take notice. We take notice of every little kid we see that has no fear. Oh, look at them, how cute. They're not afraid of anything. Okay. Don't we? Yes. Mm -hmm. That witnessing in the earth. And when you begin really busy with the fact that you've been braided together with God's life, listen, man, what is there to be afraid of? I think I said this in the Bible study before. It's a remarkable thing to consider that you've inherited God. You've inherited God, and yet we're sitting around thinking about all the different ways we don't have what we need. Just consider that statement. Okay, we've inherited God, and then we think about all the things we, we don't have that we need. Now, what do those two statements sound like together? Contradictory. That's right. Contradictory. So here's the problem. We're all the time meditating on the life that's in the world that is weakness. Those things can't give us strength anyway. Instead of considering that we've inherited God. And then living accordingly. You know, the other day I had so many things coming against me. And I don't mean like, I'm not talking like some super spiritual talk, like demons in high places. I was talking about stress, man, from every direction. We, and then on top of it, we found out that we weren't going to be able to move into that building. And I, I found myself sitting there for a, a second, and I thought, how am I going to deal with it? And then all of a sudden, I found myself thinking, I have all sufficiency in all things. And all of a sudden, it started feeling like, how am I not <laughs> to accomplish and overcome all of that? That's right. right? Yes. That's what the life of God will do to you. You'll start thinking nothing is impossible. Right? You don't judge yourself by the result of what you're doing because you can never judge the life of God by as lacking. And so you're not busy living like that. But you are living with the knowledge of the Son of God, which is that the Son of God has a life in him that lords it over sin and death. And it doesn't just lord it over sin and death in an ethereal way. It boards it over in a material way, right? Yes. It's a tangible thing. The word was made flesh. Right. And then you start walking in the power of that life, right? And I find that myself, and I think most Christians, because the gospel has been presented as God, God was angry, he wouldn't hang out with you. Now he's not angry, so he will hang out with you. He's majored in restored relationships and minor at best in Christus Victor. And so we haven't really been seeing grace abounding in our lives. We were talking about it earlier. You got probably 90% of the Christian world that will say how defeated they are and how they're just sinners and sin is all the time reigning over in their lives. And they can't seem to get free from all the works of the flesh in their lives. And the reason why is because they don't talk about the Christus Victor. They don't talk about the life of God, the word of life, the word of God's life. God's life is your life. You're free to think about your life the exact same way God would think about his life. 
You're free to do that. You're free to think about your life in the exact same way God would think about his life. You're free to walk around in the earth the same way God would walk around in the earth. No. <laughs> no. No. I'm sorry, does the scripture say that Jesus was filled with the fullness of the Godhead bodily? Yes. Was the same spirit that was in Jesus in you? Yes. Is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily? Yes. See, these are the kind of thoughts that the carnal mind do not want to entertain. No. And then if we do entertain it, we look on it from a fruit perspective. We don't think of walking around like God would walk around the earth as far as what God would believe when he walked around in the earth, we look at it from the perspective of what would God do now I'm going to go do that. No, no, no. I'm talking about you're free to believe about your life the same thing God believes about you. And I, it just so happens that that will drastically change <laughs> the way you live and move and have your being. It just so happens that it will. But we try to do it backwards. Right? We try to look on the result of what God's life will do, and then we try to copy it. Instead of first sitting with God, like Jesus sat with God for 30 years before he even performed a miracle. What do you think they were talking about? The life that they shared, and what it is, and what it does, and its makeup, and its fabric, and what it is like in light of the life that's in the world. And what do the two look like when they collide? And so we come at it backwards, and now we're trying to, what does the life of God look like? And let us just start thinking about that. And let us start considering the life of God. Like Abraham, consider the life of God. Abraham didn't get it right initially. So there's no shame for us that we hadn't gotten it right. Abraham was still considering his own sufficiency. So was Sarah. That's why they brought Hagar. I don't know, this is how we're going to be fruitful. Right? And so then God had to come and reveal himself as El Shaddai. Right? Mm -hmm. Listen, man. And so Abraham started considering the life of God. Well, God revealed himself as El Shaddai again in the resurrection of Jesus. And so he doesn't just come and tell us, your sufficiency is of me. Your sufficiency to overcome the sin and death in your flesh and in the world is of me. But he comes and puts the life that is the power behind this efficiency on display. Kabam! Let's take all the sin and death that these guys think is the biggest giant that ever was. Let's take all the sin and death that these guys think is the strongest, biggest, baddest WWF wrestler that ever lived. Let's take all that sin and death and let's see what our life does to it. And let's make a spectacle of it in the midst of the whole world, in the midst of the great congregation. And let's see it, right? Yeah. So that we can be confronted with the sufficiency that comes forth from God's life. And then we start living from the perspective of God's life. And we start being infused. The power, the force behind our lives becomes the life of God, right? right. And then you start finding your life, man, instead of sweating sweat, you'll be sweating grace. <laughs> and don't put in a box what can happen. I, I think it was... It's either Paul or Peter that they just wanted to get in his shadow. Yeah. They saw that light. They saw the light. Do you see? Mm -hmm. They saw the light, and what did they believe? That this guy's busy with the light that conquers death. And the light that he's busy with is so powerful, if I can even just get in his shadow, I'll be healed. And then it was either Paul or Peter. They just wanted a hem of his garment. Why do you think you got these people on TV trying to sell people the garment and stuff? Oh, it's anointed with oil. <laughs> Where do you think they got? Oh, they were in the aisle. And now they deceive everybody. Now these guys were so, they were so enthralled. I don't even know what the word I want to use. Consumed. They were so consumed with the life of God that it manifested. I am so much that I am. The life of God is so much that it will manifest. Right? And they were so busy with this life that people could see it. They, they, the people were so wow by the life they were busy with. If I could just touch it, if I could, Jesus, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, that woman said. Do you know why she said that? There was a, there was an ancient prophecy about the Messiah and that there were healing 
there was healing in his wings. The wings were the talits. Right. And so she, when she said, if I could just touch the hem of the garment, she was referring back to that scripture. Her heart said there's healing in his wings from sin and death. And that's why Jesus, your faith, you what you believe has made you. She was basically declaring you're the Messiah. You know what it means for him to be the Messiah? You're Lord. You know what that means? He's Lord over sin and death. I have sin and death in my life, and I need it to be lorded over. And there's something in him that lords it over sin and death. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, poof. She could see the life in him. That's right. Yeah. See it. He was a witness. Yeah. And that's what it means. You're a witness of a life that smacks around sin and death. The life that's born from the world is smacked around by sin and death. Yes. Exactly. That's the life we keep trying to be busy with. Right? Why do you think I've spent so much time preaching about we're crucified with Christ? We're dead to the world and the world to us. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you can't enjoy a movie. It means you enjoy a movie much more when you realize you're dead to the world and the world's dead to you. Right? What Paul's saying there is we're in this world, but our life is no longer but dust. Our life is no longer earthy. It's no longer born from below. The power behind our life is no longer human ability. The fabric of our lives is heavenly now, right? So we're in this world, but our life isn't of the fabric of this world. We're in this world, but our life is of the fabric of heaven. And you begin walking in the world that way, seeing you were divorced from the life that's born from below, the life that's but us, and now you're born from above, which means your life that you have now has been born from above, a heavenly country, right? And the life that's in that country isn't at the mercy of sin and death. The life that's in that country makes the sin and death bow down. And that's what we need our hearts and our minds to be filled with and consumed with. That's what we need to encourage each other in as we walk in this world. This is the message we need to be hearing. This is the message we need to be talking about. This is the message we need to be reminded of. This is the message we want to be talking with God about in our private time. We want to be talking with God about his life, the life that was from the beginning, that when there was nothing created all things, that even when there was darkness and chaos and disorder, it brought forth order and, and light and life everywhere. That's what we want our conversation with God to be about. Because that conversation is full of strength for us. It's full of dunamis for us. It's like getting injected with heavenly steroids. <laughs> Listen, I had a lot of friends in high school who did a whole lot of steroids. Yeah. I had to inject them all. I didn't have to, but they asked me to inject them. And I did. But that's what it's like, man. And Christians, oh, oh. I remember, what, man, I was at one conference just hammering away about the power of God's life. And a guy actually said, a guy has been a Christian his whole life, and I don't fault him. He's been taught this. Well, in theory, that sounds good. Yes. In theory. Uh, right. No. It's not theoretical, brother. <laughs> and that's how we're all living. I promise you, man. We're all looking at sin and death like it's Goliath. Yes. And we're just, we're just, what did, I promise you, you're bigger than David. And you know what we're doing? We're oh, looking for the theory. You're definitely <laughs> bigger than David. You're definitely bigger than David. 411? Yeah. It was shorter than that. Yeah. Go stand in the, in the, in the hallway. In the, in the church. Oh, that, in the church. Yeah. Where we have David and Goliath. Yeah. Sin and death. We, it's like, did, did you think the giant looked bigger than, to David than anybody? And what did David think? <laughs> what did David think about that giant? What did David think about the lion? And the bear. That God was a sufficient teacher. Right. That God's sufficiency was more than enough. You think David was thinking about his own sufficiency? When Saul was like, bro, you can't go fight the giant. And then after David persisted, Saul was like, well, maybe it's good if he died. Some people think, all right. We'll, we'll let him go. He tried to give David his armor. What does David say? I don't need that crap, man. You think David was busy thinking of his own sufficiency? No. He was thinking of the sufficiency of God's life is more than enough to whoop this giant. And I've been brought forth and conceived in the power of God's life. Right? I've been anointed. 
with God's life, his grace, which comes forth from his life, right? And I think that's one of the big things that people didn't understand about God and I didn't understand about God is that God's grace is born from his life. He's got a power. He's got a strength just like I did with Popeye, right? Popeye has a strength that comes from the spinach. Right. Now, God's not Popeye, nor can he ever be weak. So please understand that the example is not like supposed to be impeccably tight. Right? It's a false analogy, but nonetheless, it can help you to help. see. To help. The grace that comes out of God is born from his eternal life. If you go read John 1, it says, in Jesus was life. goes on to say he came full of grace. Right? So there was a life in him that was full of grace. And to all those, John goes on to say, to all those who make use of that life as if it was their own life. They shall receive what? Power, strength, dunamis, grace to what? Appear as the sons and daughters of God. So there's a life in Jesus that is full of strength to do what? Overcome the sin and death that's in the world. And that life manifested in him. It showed all of us that that life has a strength in it to overcome sin and death. Now to all those who will make use of that life or receive it, it says in English, which means to grab a hold of it, to make use of it, for yourself as if it were your life. To all those who grab a hold of it, they shall be infused with the vitality and the strength of God to overcome the sin and death in the earth and appear as the sons and daughters of God. And oh, by the way, as they walk in the world for a while, they're going to be witnessed. Right? Because this life will always testify. The eternal life of God will always testify of the strength and sufficiency of God. It will never not testify. In all things, it will testify. I mean, look at the life of God in Jesus as he's nailed to a tree. Do you see what it strengthened him with in the inner man? He turned the other cheek. He blessed those who were cursing him. He prayed for the people who were despitefully using him. He was a witness that there was something in him that was greater than the sin and death that was in him. Right? Love covers a multitude of sins, it says. You see where that came from? You see how this looks and how this works? That's why I'm always talking about eternal life. And listen, have mercy on my soul. Because although I like some of the words that I use, I can feel inside of myself that there is more descriptive words I can use to describe God's life. And so thank you for your compassion towards me and, and allowing me to keep saying some of the, the words that I've already said. There, it's like this. I just keep saying But it. rest assured, yeah. you don't need me to get the words right for you to find the dunamis born in you. Because there may not be able to be human words that can accurately describe the life of God. Mm -hmm. And it may just be in the expression that there is such a life, the heart can inquire into God. And we can find a revelation that isn't born from an explanation, but it's born from an experience. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's an experiential knowing of the life of God. That maybe sometimes the human brain, as much as I think I can grasp how to say something, maybe you can't actually grasp that. Right? right. Yeah. Does that make any sense? But that's how we're going to find the grace of God manifest in our life. So now we've got this grace of God thing as, oh, well, God's not holding our sin against us. <laughs> how we, that is <coughs> yeah. Yes, it's nice to hear yeah. that, that God's not holding your sin against you. That is nice to hear, but when you boil that down to the grace of God, dilutes it, it waters it down. It's better than nothing, right? I mean, if you're a beggar on the street and you ain't eating in a month, listen, that's a nice little morsel. I remember when I, I, I first considered that God wasn't holding my sin against me. That was a nice little morsel at the time. But I was so dry and so empty that, you know, anything would have been a nice little morsel. But the power wasn't contained in that. That was just enough to be like, was it Hans and Gretel with the bread, yeah. crumbs? It was just enough to like start laying the trail. Hey, come, come over here. You know? Oh yeah, I'm so I'm a You know? I'll take you. Next thing you know, you get to the real. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> and then you start realizing what it. How can Jesus say those that eat his flesh and drink it from ever hungry? Oh, I don't know. Can I go dress like this? How can Jesus say that they'll never thirst again? What's he talking about there, man? Let me in, Eugene. He's talking about a life that 
is all and that fills all, right? So whatever empty spaces you think are in the world or in your life, there's a life that you've been made a sharer in with God. You've been braided, you've been infused with it. It's part of your DNA that fills all the empty places, that fills all the dry places, that speaks life into dead bones. What did Ezekiel, what did God say to Ezekiel, son of man, speak life into those dead bones? Right? Man, so that's where the grace of God is contained, right? That's why I'm so passionate about life and death, because that's, that's, that's what torments us. That's why people don't walk in freedom, liberty, dunamis, right? right. We, we, we made the gospel about, okay, gospel is good. Now, we're going to use the gospel to continue to drink the life that's from the world. Yeah. No, man. We're not going to use the gospel to continue to drink from the life that's in the world. We're going to hear the gospel and see that our life is heaven. Right? Put an end to sin consciousness. Yeah. Put an end to, which is put an end to, I lack. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Sin consciousness is the foundation of this church. That's it. Have you ever felt strong when you felt that you lacked something? No. You ever felt strong there? No. Well, then, can it be the truth? No. Do we ever think that there could be something that's true? or that is the truth from God, that would result in us being strengthened. It's impossible. It's impossible. Right. So in the day we're busy feeling lack, doesn't that mean that what we're thinking about isn't true? It's not born from above. It's not born from above. That's right. It's one of the main revelations I love in, in songs about Jesus. Because there's no worse example of a guy that the world would say lacked than Jesus nailed to the tree. There's no greater example of what the world would say is a guy that lacked everything. He didn't just lack some things. He, didn't, he wasn't even wearing a loin. He lacked everything. And that guy says, the Lord is my shepherd. I do not lack. He's, my cup runneth over. Do you see how the life Jesus was busy with? How many empty spaces do you think there were? around Jesus as he's nailed to that tree. And the life that he was busy with filled all the, it was all and in all. It filled all the empty space. And the judgment that was taking place at the cross there, the people seeing and believing and being affected by that light and others reject, actually rejecting it. I mean, it was just, Drawing this disparity between the people. Yeah. And it made foolish the wisdom of the world. Yeah. Right? It showed that the wisdom that showed that the strength that was of the world wasn't strength at all. Right. That it was actually all weakness yeah. and all insufficiency. Right? But with the centurion that was crucified said that was a righteous man. Yeah. I love that centurion. It's funny you say that because all the times where I ask God, how is it that Jesus did that? How did he love those people? And I, I'm just serious. How was he not offended as they're driving those stakes into his hands? I mean, I know he didn't use his willpower, but the centurion is kind of where I started tracking with that because I always felt kind of like the centurion. Like he looks up at Jesus and he's busy thinking, how is it that that guy just said what he said? How, Father, forgive them. And then into your hand, how is it that that guy did that? He must be a righteous man. You see what I'm saying? And one of the, one of the uh, accounts say, Surely that was a son of God. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. So I hope that makes some sense, man. What's in my heart is there's a whole lot of people that know there is such a thing as grace. They don't know where it comes from, and they don't know what animates their life with it. And they've actually been taught to walk in the opposite of the thing that will animate them with life. And they've actually been taught the scriptures where Paul is clearly laying this out in a way that causes them to continue to walk in life. Like what I said about what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Right? We get to Romans 6, verse 1, and there's the dictionary of our own hearts. 
We all have our own little dictionary in there, and we get to what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin? Forget what Paul just said. We got our own definition for the word sin. What shall we say? Shall we continue to steal? Shall we continue? He's that man. He's not talking about that. He just said what it meant for sin to reign. What it meant was sin caused death to reign, which means we were separated from the tree of life. We couldn't eat from the tree of life. Remember the cherubims were in the way? So to continue in sin would be to continue as if the cherubims were still keeping us from the tree of life. It would be to continue as if death is still reigning over you. It would be to continue as if the bite of the serpent was still biting you. What is the bite of the serpent? It's the word of what you lack in the way of what is needed to have life. And God's busy telling you, here's the tree of life. There's no lack in my life, man. I've made a way for you to go eat from it freely. And so Paul's saying, shall we continue as if death is reigning over us? No, that's what filled us with all weakness. That's what caused us to be taken captive and become slaves to sin. That's what gave sin its power to bring forth its fruit in us. It's to continue in the word of what we lack. But God, the grace of Christ is superabounded over the sin of Adam. And now the cherubims that were marking the tree of life, they've been moved out of the way. Don't you know? And so now we're no longer walking as if the cherubims are still guarding the tree of life. We're walking knowing we can eat freely from God's life. That's walking in the newness of life. It is. Yes. We're married to the new man. We're not married to the old man. The old man is the man that's one with death, clothed in death. The new man is the man that's one with God's life and immortality, clothed in life. Who are we married to? You know, if you go and look at ancient weddings, the life of the husband was considered to be reigning over the wife, not in the sense of indentured servitude, but in the sense of her life came under the power of his life. She became a beneficiary of everything in his life. And that's what it would mean for us to be married to the new man, who's one with eternal life. We become one flesh with eternal life in this new man, Christ Jesus. Right? That's what we become one with. What did Jesus say? It is finished. What was finished, guys? Because he hadn't even freaking been raised from the dead yet. What is he saying in this minute? We're, that we are under the bondage of sin and death. So right. Care of. Divorce. Right. Why? Because he was dying unto man's union to death. Yes. How is a, a person set free from the law of their husband? Through death. Through death. And so how are we going to be set free from this death reigning over us? By us dying in Christ to death. And then as he gives his last breath, what does he say? It is finished. And then what does the scripture say? The veil was rent from top to bottom. You know what was on that veil? Cherubim. The cherubims were etched on that veil. What cherubims? The cherubims that were guarding the way to the tree of life. So Jesus was saying, it is finished. I'm giving up the ghost. I'm breathing my last breath. Man is divorced from death. It is done. Our desire to divorce man from death, our desire for your, our grace to super abound over the sin of Adam and to remove the reign of death from man so that man can walk in the newness of life and come and eat freely from the tree of life. It's finished. Bam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and now we walk in that. And the world's all the time trying to tell us how we're still separated from life. You know how you continue in sin? You continue as if it's true that you're separated from some good thing that you need for life. You keep walking in that. You want to find yourself filled with weakness? You keep walking in the word of what you got. You keep walking as if the bite of the serpent can take from you. That's how you continue in sin. Sure. I'm just being honest. <laughs> you keep walking in the word of how God thinks you lack. You keep walking in the word of how you lack what you need. You keep walking in that word. Sin will reign over your members. Right? So now we all go to church on Sunday and hear how dissatisfied God is with us. <laughs> oh, we lack. We go to church and they put us under the power of sin. Right? They tell us how much we lack. And how we can fill all of our lack from our own sufficient to do. Right? Does everybody see how you continue in sin? We've looked at the fruit that comes forth from a person should they continue in sin. And we've made that what it means to continue in sin. No, no, no. Paul just said, 
sin caused death to reign over all. So what does it mean to continue in sin? It means to continue as if death still has dominion over you. It means to continue as if the world is still the father of your life. That's how you continue in sin. It means to continue as if you weren't crucified with Christ and you aren't dead to the world and the world to you. That's what it would mean, right? That's why Paul goes on to say, well, just as Christ died unto sin once for all time, death hath no dominion over him. Likewise, consider yourself to be dead to sin. Dead to what? The bite of sin. What is the bite of sin? Yeah. Consider yourself dead to death. Consider yourself dead to the world and the life that's in the world. And consider yourself alive to God. Amen. I've inherited God. Yes. I'm alive to God and his eternal life. Right. I'm braided together with that. They that see or that believe they're alive to God, they that are braided together, intertwined with God and his eternal life, shall receive strength. It actually says in the Hebrew, shall be brought forth in strength, shall be conceived in strength. Those that see their life has been separated from the fabric of the earth or the dust and has been braided together with the heavenly fabric of God's life, they shall be conceived or brought forth in dunamis. See that? Yeah. That's amazing. That's spinach, man. <laughs> and I mean in the cartoon sense, not in like yeah, right. the sense here. Because <laughs> I don't know about you guys, when I was little, I would leave that cartoon and I would go and ask my mom to get spinach. I didn't like the way it tasted back then. But I thought if I ate that spinach, I could do those crazy things. Like my, I could get a pipe and then flip around and shoot me off the air and I fly around and stuff. Like the 10th thing you don't like. No. I like those cartoons. <laughs> Does, there, does everybody understand all? Yeah. Online, y'all okay online? When To walk in the power of grace means to walk in the newness of life. To walk under the power of sin means to walk as if death is still reigning over you. My life still lacks. I lack something I need for life. Right? That's how you come under the power of sin. That's what it means to submit yourself to sin. And that's how you become taken captive by sin. It's by you walk in the word of a life that's full of lack. When you walk in a word, in the word of a life that's full of lack, sin will take your members captive. And you'll become a slave to unrighteousness. Right? right? Yeah. Because if you walk in the word of a life that lacks, you know what you're going to be busy doing? Trying to get fill that lack. Trying to fill that lack. You know what happens when you try to fill that lack with your own sufficiency? Fruit of the death comes forth. The fruit of death comes out of you. And that's how you become a slave to sin. Takes you captive to laboring and toiling. Paul said, our flesh doesn't possess the ability to produce sufficiency. So if we engage that flesh to produce sufficiency, we're going to be taken captive to unrighteousness. Right? right. I hope that makes some sense. Man, man that was good. I don't know if we need to go any further. No, I think that's it. You're still injecting people with steroids to a different kind. <laughs> that's good. You're injecting them with a whole different kind. So I'll have to tell my, because I still have contact with some of those friends I injected. I'll have to tell them that you said that. They'll get a big kick out of it. <laughs> some things never change. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, man. All right. Well, we, can, we can quit there. That's I'm full of stew and <laughs> I hope you guys just understand the dynamics. I think every Christian wants grace to abound in their life. <laughs> but I think I've met very few people that understand that dynamic. And it's not that they're ignorant or dumb, right? It has nothing to do with that. But never heard it. Right. <laughs> we can just start thinking of walking in newness of life. Father, what does that mean? Yeah. To walk in if you just start talking with God about that. Listen, man, you will find the dunamis of God standing up on the inside of you, being a witness for you, right? You'll find yourself taken captive by the dunamis of God. Like Paul would come and say, listen, even though I was the least of all the apostles, I labored more abundantly 
than them all. Yet not I. It was the dunamis of God in them. Yeah. Right? I, I think actually the last three weeks, the dunamis of God in you yes. has ministered to all of us that yeah. exact word that we want to talk about. The glory to God. And I yeah. feel happy about yeah. that. Yeah. You should. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's changed my perspective on a lot of stuff. Yeah. All right. So. All right. We'll call it quits. Glory to God. Thank you guys. So Thanks, much. guys. We love you guys. We love you all. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, love you. Love you all. Love you, too. Right. Sherry wants someone to hug all of the women in here for her so she feels happy. Oh, so. Sherry. <laughs> we'll hug each other. There's a hug back, Sherry. The guys. Loving you. Bye-bye. Bye, Snyder. Bye. Bye, y'all. <laughs> See you going, going.